At this time, I'd like to invite one of our 2018 confirmands, Knox Watson, to come and invoke God's blessings on this day and on our worship service this morning. Let us pray with him as he comes. Gracious and divine God, resolute in overseeing the spread of happiness from person to person, help us to welcome those who are new to our community and guide our ambition to further the welcoming glow of our church so that we may enjoy the company of even more companions in worship and in life. We give thanks for the ability to enjoy life in Weston and for our opportunity to project an image of support for the surrounding world. We give thanks for the happiness we enjoy during our time at the sanctuary and for the faith that that happiness may continue. Amen. Good morning, would you please join with me in the call to worship printed in your bulletin. Let us be like Moses, who heard God's voice and followed God's call. May we with faith follow the commandments God gave. Let us be like the wise men, who recognized a sign and followed the star. May we see the path that leads to Christ. Let us be disciples, ready to follow as soon as we are called. May we follow the one who teaches us all. Let us give thanks for the journey that brings us each here. Yeah. Gather together, let us worship the Lord. Diane offers the pastoral prayer. I just want to acknowledge the presence of Jody Hedberg, yeah. who is yeah. with us in church yeah. for a long time. Well done, Jody. I have to tell you a very sweet story about Jody. My, my mother fell and, and broke her leg last fall, and um, Jody sent me the sweetest email encouraging me, encouraging me to be a good encourager to my mother to heal and heal, heal well. And so God 
has its own plan, doesn't he, Jody? But thank you for being here and for being um, a spiritual guide to me during a difficult time. And that's what we are, aren't we? Uh, a community of faith who is all there for one another. Let us pray. Precious Lord, we thank you for the privilege of worshiping you freely and joyfully in your house this morning. We praise you for the reception of new members who have found a welcoming and faithful community. We ask that you speak through Reverend Wilson this morning as he calls us to be Jesus' disciples in our world so hungry for his message of love and promise. Take our hands, lead us on, help us stand. For some of us come tired and weak and worn because we simply are a people who want the world's groaning to stop. We would like to shut our eyes to the news and close our ears to the clamoring, but we can't. And we know that you never shut your eyes or close your ears or turn your back on us, never. And so once again, we thank you with words that are so inadequate because your love is so big and your mercy is so wide and your passion is so deep and we are the blessed recipients. So guide us that we, we can see the good news in this world that does exist. The deeds done that make you smile. The love exchange that makes you dance. Marchers in the streets. Hard conversations that turn into understanding. Help us to know how to heal our divisions. And to talk with honesty. And to hear with understanding. And to act as people confident in your love. Not only for us but for all of your people in this world. Come close, O oh Lord. Be with those who are mourning the death of loved ones. Heal those who are sick in mind, body, and soul. Heal the divisions that exist in our world and in our families, animosities that won't let go. Please, Lord, raise up leaders whose voices stir us to good action and increase love and abiding respect. Help us to, to discern the prophets <coughs> amongst us. Help us, great God, to put down our fishing rods of busyness to follow you, no matter where that may be. Precious Lord, take our hands, linger near, and hear our prayers as we pray the same prayer you prayed with those first disciples, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. Amen. Northfield, do you promise to care for and support them as they grow in their relationship with God and our church family? If so, please say, we do. We, we do. do. Let us all stand and affirm the covenant of your God. Confirm in us the power of your covenant 
that we may live in your spirit, share regularly in worship, and so love each other that we may have among us the same mind which was in Christ Jesus, to all honor and glory. Amen. Amen. My brothers and sisters, would you join me in welcoming our Lewis members?
At this time, I'd like to invite Sean Bradshaw Mack and Knox Watson, our 2018 confirmants, to come forward for our scripture readings this morning. Uh, this reading is from Mark chapter 1, verses 14 to 20. Um, now, after John was arrested, Jesus came to Galilee, proclaiming the good news of God and saying, the time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God has come near. Repent and believe in the good news. As Jesus passed along the Sea of Galilee, he saw Simon and his brother Andrew casting a net into the sea, for they were fishermen. And Jesus said to them, Follow me, and I will make you a fish. I will make you fish for the people. And immediately they left their nets and followed him. As he went a little farther, he saw James, son of Zebade, and his brother John, who were in their boat mending the nets. Immediately he called them, and they left their father Zebade in the boat with the hired men and followed him. Our second reading is from Matthew chapter 4, verses 18 through 20. As he walked by the Sea of Galilee, he saw two brothers, Simon, who was called Peter, and Andrew, his brother, casting a net into the sea, for they were fishermen. And he said to them, follow me, and I will make you fish for people. Immediately, they left their nets and followed him. This reading is from Luke chapter 18, verse 22. When Jesus heard this, he said to them, there is still one thing lacking, Sell all that you own and distribute the money to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven then. Come follow me. And our final reading is from John chapter 10, verses 27 through 30. My sheep hear my voice. I know them, and they follow me. I give them eternal life, and they will never perish. No one will snatch them out of my hand. What my Father has given me is greater than all else, and no one can snatch it out of the Father's hand. The Father and I are one. I have decided to
Thank you for that, David. Would you join me in prayer? Lord Jesus, thank you for finding us where we are and loving us and calling us to follow you in this world as your disciples. Give us strength for the journey and joy to walk in the light you shine. And it is in your name that we pray this. Amen. Amen. Author and poet Langston Hughes was one of the great figures of the so-called Harlem Renaissance, a cultural and artistic explosion that took place in Harlem during the 1920s. One of the many books Hughes wrote was one titled Simple's Uncle Sam. It was a collection of stories featuring the hilarious musing, the pseudo-intellectual rants, and the plain common sense of one Jesse B. Simple. My favorite Jesse B. Simple story is one titled, Feet Live Their Own Life. <laughs> Feet Live Their Own Life. And it begins like this. If anybody was to write the history of my life, they should start with my feet. These feet have stood on every rock from the Rock of Ages to 135th Street and Lenox Avenue. These feet have stood at altars, bars, graves, kitchen doors, bedding windows, hospital clinics, and in all kinds of lines, from soup lines to lunch lines to the draft line. If I had four feet, I could have stood in more places longer. As it is, I done wore out 700 pairs of shoes, 89 tennis shoes, 12 summer sandals, and six loafers. The socks that covered these feet could build a knitting mill. The corns I've cut away from these feet would dull a razor. The bunions I forgot would make you ache from now till judgment day. This right foot broke that window over there and this left foot carried me off running as soon as my right foot came down. <laughs> Nobody else's feet saved me from the cops that night but these two feet right here. Yes, if anybody was to write the history of my life, they should start with my feet. Don't tell me these feet ain't had a life of their own. Feet. Author and preacher, the late Frederick Beekner says, our feet do more than just smell. They speak. And that we answer any call with our feet. If we believe something, or decide to do something, or commit to join something, we do it with our feet. And if we don't believe something, or if we decide not to do something, or to not join something, we simply tell our feet, don't move. And we pretend we didn't hear the call. But if we decide to answer the call and follow the voice that calls us, we have to follow with our feet. Feet. We all know that we are living in tough and testing times. Fire and mudslides in California, snow and ice across the South, power outages in Puerto Rico, uprisings in Iran and other places around the world, threats of pushing nuclear buttons by those with buttons to push, earthquakes in too many places to count, terrorism striking around the world, a drug epidemic that's out of control, challenges at home, work, in our relationships and polarization in our politics that stifles our progress as a nation and shuts down our government to boot. And in times such as these, we can't help but wonder, is there a word from the Lord? Well, we get a response in the Gospels. In fact, all of the Gospels. In fact, 23 times in the Gospels, Jesus calls on all who hears his voice to stop whatever they are doing, and follow him. In our text from Mark's gospel, Jesus says to the brothers Peter and Andrew, put down your fishing nets and follow me. Jesus challenges the brothers James and John, leave your father's fishing business and come follow me. Jesus spots a man sitting at his tax office desk and Jesus says these same two words, follow me. 
And Matthew puts down his pen or turns off his calculator or shuts down his computer or disconnects his cell phone and wonders of wonders, Matthew gets up from his desk and with his feet follows Jesus. It is absolutely incredible. And these are the same two words that Jesus utters to the one who told Jesus that he had more important things to do, like bury his dad who had just died. And Jesus was clear, let the dead bury the dead. Come now and follow me. To the rich young ruler who wants to know what must I do to inherit eternal life, Jesus tells him, sell all you have and give to the poor and then come follow me. And to all people in all places for all times, Jesus says, if you want to be my disciple, you must deny yourself, pick up your cross, and do what? Amen. And as far as we can tell, the 12, Jesus called to be his companions, were ordinary people. As far as we can tell, Jesus didn't do background checks to determine IQ levels, financial acumen, professional skills, or temple education. Jesus picked people much like you and me, followers who were anything but perfect, who misunderstood him, denied him, betrayed him. But these were they to whom Jesus entrusted the work God sent him to do, and who would continue Jesus' work on earth after he left. Follow me. Follow me requires that we put our faith in a person who will lead us to safety, to security, to salvation, who will lead us to love one another and to the peace that God has for us. Well, a long time ago, Jesus spoke these two simple words, follow me, to his closest followers. And his invitation stands today. Come, follow me, Jesus said, and I will show you how to fish for people. I will show you how to start over, to begin anew, I will show you how to forgive yourself, forgive others, to find forgiveness, and follow me, and I will show you how to navigate the storms of life. Follow me, Jesus says, and I will help you to find purpose for life, your purpose, God's purpose for your life. Follow me, and I will show you how to face death itself. And when we commit to following Jesus, we find new purpose, new hope, new life. Who wants to follow someone who doesn't know where they are going? It would be the classic blind leading the blind to follow someone without a sense of direction or purpose. And all of us know people who seem aimless in life, stuck in the mud and mire of life, who are paralyzed by life's bumps and bruises and living hopelessly in despair. And that is why Jesus says, follow me and I will help you fish for people just like this. And here's something else. A person who says, follow me, is more focused on what is yet to be than on what has already been. This is why I love that Jesus says, follow me, because follow me says that Jesus isn't focused on my past and the so many things I've done wrong. Jesus isn't focused on trying to help me see what an awful person I am. No, Jesus is always looking ahead and saying, if you want to follow me, I'm not concerned about what you've done wrong or how many times you've done it. Jesus isn't interested in critiquing or criticizing us for our faults, our failures, or for falling down more times than we can count. No, what Jesus wants to know is, are you willing to get up and follow me now? Being a follower of Jesus, being a faithful Christian, is not just about what we think or believe. It's also about what we do and about what God has done for us and what God wants to do through us. And once we get over life being just about us, then following Christ becomes just a part of who we are and what we are. Amen. And Northfield, follow me ought to permeate our every action as a congregation. Early in our service, we received into membership several new members. And I hope that our new members are joining our Norfield family because they believe this congregation has a mission, a purpose, and is on the move to make a difference in this community and in the world as we follow Jesus. 
You know, at the many meetings of Northfield's boards, committees, and ministry teams, the question of whether we are following Jesus and moving in the direction that demonstrates our spirit to follow Jesus in word and deed. And that spirit is present in the prayers that are uttered when our meetings begin, in the discussions and debate that ensue, in the actions we take and the policies we set. We don't always agree on every decision that is made. But I say we all agree that we are here to follow Jesus as best we can. That we are here to say, where he leads, we will follow. And the invitation to follow Jesus sometimes requires sacrifice. For Matthew required giving up his livelihood as a tax collector. Brothers Peter and Andrew had to leave mother, fathers, sisters, brothers, wives and children, houses and land. Brother James and John left their father's fishing business. And perhaps that's what it's all about. Perhaps following Jesus means we will have to make tough decisions and choices along the way to demonstrate that we are following Jesus with all our heart, our mind, and our soul. But if we decide to follow Jesus, we have to follow with our feet. And who knows where our feet will lead us? Perhaps to nursing homes, where the feet of the aging can no longer move. Perhaps to hospitals, where the feet of the sick are confined to their beds. Maybe when we follow Jesus, our feet will take us to Appalachia, Bridgeport, Puerto Rico, and to hamlets, to huts, and to holes of all kinds, where children are dying of diseases we can't cure, and starving while searching for clean water to drink. And our task as the church of the living God is to walk in the light of our Savior and to seek and to search for those who are lost, who are lonely, who are about to give up, and feeling as if there is no one anywhere who cares. And Norfield, that is why I want to ask if you will follow me only as I follow Christ and help me to reach those souls who need to know the love of God that we know in Jesus Christ. In his book, The Jesus I Never Knew, Philip Yancey asserts something that I am certain is true. Yancey notes that in too many movies about Jesus, the actor who portrays the carpenter's son from Nazareth often comes across very flat. His words are delivered in a kind of monotone, and his demeanor is placid to the point of being dull. Who wants to follow someone like that? But Yancey says that based on his readings of the gospel, Jesus must have been a whole lot happier looking and much more outwardly joyful because people really liked being around Jesus. Something about Jesus made people want to follow him. People were attracted to Jesus and they followed Jesus because something about Jesus gave them purpose, direction, and hope for their lives. And my sisters and brothers, I hope you too will follow Jesus because he still gives purpose, direction, and hope to those who decide to follow him. Because Jesus still gives purpose, direction, and hope for our lives. And when we decide to follow Jesus, Jesus leads us to the God, to God, and to the richer, deeper, and more meaningful life than we could ever have imagined for ourselves. Who wouldn't follow someone like that? Amen. Amen. Amen.